Ladies and gentlemen, Bill sent me an email which didn't have an I decline option within it. So I have to follow this miserable man who would have told you gloomy things about policy last year and have discovered in the last month that I know nothing about it. Incidentally, I would remind you that you just have one and a half hours to stop this man becoming your future president. <laughs> so I thought I'd take a more cheerful approach to um, policy developments, or at least that was my intention a few weeks ago before I'd actually tried to find out what had happened in the last year. And essentially nothing really very substantial has been achieved, at least not at a global scale, because it has been the economy stupid. The individual governments to some extent have made some progress, but internationally the obsession with getting economic growth back running and um, worrying about what your voters are going to say if you were to uh, undertake any short-term expenditure, regardless of how, long, how great the long-term benefits might be, was very difficult to achieve at the moment. So I'm going to consider in the first part of the talk two kind of key issues, the first here represented by the tree of life, biodiversity, and then move on to climate change. So how are we doing for biodiversity? The Living Planet Index tells us that overall biodiversity is still declining, particularly in the tropics where we've had overall since 1970 around about 60% decline of, based on population trends. Things seem to be going well in the temperate zone, largely based on marine systems, though I do wonder about the taxonomic uh, distribution here because certainly the terrestrial invertebrate groups I'm familiar with have shown continued decline over the last few decades. So biodiversity is still struggling. I've been seeing various news items about rediscovered species, Silums, mountain finch for example this year. But, and I wondered what had happened to the extinction crisis against all of this sort of biodiversity decline. So I went to the IUCN webpage and found far less of a fanfare that some species have actually been declared extinct this year. These are two species of plant um, represented by those brown things that you can't see from the back anyway, but they still look grotty from the front. Um, uh, two species of plant associated with copper-rich soils in the Congo, which has been turned into open cast mine. Notice that these things haven't been seen in the wild for several decades, but they've only just bothered to s trouble the scorers because new uh, surveys have been carried out and we can actually declare them extinct or likely to be extinct. Similarly, two freshwater mussels uh, gone extinct as a result of uh, impounding a river. Actually, the, um, the reservoirs were put in place back in the 1960s, but they're now declared extinct. And that leads us to a rather odd situation that in fact the species that have gone extinct this year, I can't really tell you what they are because we won't actually document what they were probably for several more decades. Lonesome George died. Um, this this is the, was the last Pinter Island tortoise, um, although there are some argument as to whether genotypes um, of the same species are present on Volcan Wolf in the north of uh, Isabella Island. So now we are left, now lo Lonesome George is gone, we've got Lonesome Jeremy, it's a pity my brother, whose first name is Jeremy, is not here to see this. Um, <laughs> But this is a fantastic frog. It's got sort of, flat, sort of skinny bits between its toes, so it could, in principle, do a bit of gliding. I couldn't find a film of this species doing it. So, um, terribly sad, discovered 2005, described 2008, down two, I think two males were alive at the beginning of this year. Now we're down to one. And this is another casualty of chytrid fungus disease uh, spreading through the world. So, all these negative extinctions, negative biodiversity trends, but it's okay, the part 
is going to take place in Rio de Janeiro, and we're going to solve the Earth's biodiversity problems and simultaneously uh, solve humanity's issues of sustainable development. So everybody went to Rio, had a wonderful time, and got together in order to uh, sort out the planet's problems. The most moving speech, to my mind by a long way, was that given by uh, Brittany Trilford, a girl from New Zealand who won a competition to represent the three billion children on the planet. And the most famous quote from that speech was, are you here to save face or are you here to save us? Well, save us, I think, probably. I suspect that a lot of useful things happened at the meeting of individual interactions between um, NGOs and government and representatives from different countries. But overall, there was no capacity for representatives of governments to work together to make the hard decisions that probably most people in this room would think are required. There was an agreement to talk a bit more. So we need new sustainable development goals, and the principle is that these will be developed in 2013 because the Millennium Development Goals are going to lapse in 2015, so we need to sort that out. And there were some quite large pledges of money, some of which was probably rebadging, but at least this was a very welcome um, uh, commitment to sustainable development projects. Another international development on the biodiversity front is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which has been gradually being born. And um, I spent several happy hours on its web pages, and I'm very pleased to say that Georgina said that um, you should take up with me anything that I refer to uh, that you don't like in this talk. Well, if you want to work out how this thing's going to work, talk to Georgina. I spent several hours, and I actually couldn't work out what exactly it was going to do. Now, it may be very useful at bringing information together and influencing governments to act, but so far, not being on the inside of this, I actually couldn't work it out. The best thing to happen, in my mind, on the biodiversity front in the year was the uh, declaration recently that you've probably seen in the news of shark sanctuaries in the Pacific. And these are two mega areas, you probably can't see from the back, but this large area of Polynesia, French Polynesia, the Cook Islands. So that's 6.7 million square kilometers. Australia, 7.6 million square kilometers. So not far off that size. And in Micronesia as well, slightly further north, another 5 million square kilometers, where in at least some of the area, even owning shark products would become uh, illegal. So this really could be pretty interesting. And I think that there could be an awful lot of interest in uh, large scale ecological research if different parts of the Pacific come to have very different shark densities as a consequence of this. I should add that I'm largely avoiding discussion of marine systems, A, because of my total ignorance, and B, because we're hoping that Callum Roberts will be delivering this lecture next year, and as a marine biologist and conservationist, he will be far better placed to uh, talk about it. So what about global warming? Um, how are we doing? Uh, brilliant, of course. So this curve is going to be very difficult to see from the back. Um, so during these dots are uh, annual emissions. This is just for fossil fuel, cement, and gas flaring. 1990s, 1% growth per year in these emissions. Since 2000, it's gone up to about 3% per year. Little dent here for recession. We are starting to crawl up this red line. The red line, if unchecked, takes us to an estimated four to six degrees warming by the end of the century, by which time very large numbers of species would have gone extinct. Virtually all ecosystems would be already have undertaken or be in major transition. If we're really going to something like a global average of five degrees warming, it's going to be more on land and it's more in the temperate zone than in the tropics. So this is really, we're heading for an extraordinarily large perturbation to the planet. So what are the consequences? Well, this year we've seen the lowest ice cover in the Arctic. 
leading to, um, again, for I think it's the fourth year out of the last decade, we're seeing walruses pulling themselves up in large numbers on the shore because their ice flows have been removed, including uh, keeping them uh, concentrated away from major feeding grounds in many cases, and actually large numbers of young walruses simply got crushed to death in the crowds on the beach. So this is not a long-term sustainable situation. At the current rate, by mid-century, this is an, given an extreme year, by mid-century, we might see our first uh, ice-free uh, summers in the Arctic. So off to Qatar, to Doha meetings, to sort out another opportunity for the world to act on climate change this time. So how did we do there? Did we just talk? Um, so, this was really, really critical because the Kyoto Protocol comes to an end this year. So, if nothing happened, we would have no controls whatsoever internationally come next year and beyond. And so, as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change said, it was critical to act and to negotiate and ratify stringent emission reductions. So that's what we had to do. What did we do? Bugger all. We've extended the Kyoto Protocol to 2010. I'll come back to that. We've got a timetable to talk about new agreements. Those agreements, well, that's actually what we've had the last three years, and we haven't managed to do them. So this is pretty dire, I would say. Those um, agreements reached in 2015 wouldn't actually come into act, wouldn't uh, become operational until 2020. So this is another eight years. We're also going to talk in a rather interesting way, potentially, and the first agreement to talk about it, but it's only an agreement to talk, no action, about compensating mechanisms for countries that are damaged. So this, though, is a philosophical nightmare. It's saying we are accepting globally that we're going to pay for the damage because we can't agree to fix the problem before it happens. Governments have been too occupied again with their local economic growth and the petty discussions of who's getting what from whom to be able to come to these crucial global agreements. So this was the situation at the beginning of the meeting where the, I apologize for the color scheme, which I didn't create myself. Canada had already withdrawn from the Kyoto Protocol. The US never signed it. Europe's in, Russia's in, Japan, where the Kyoto Treaty was signed, was in, Australasia in, and others were, had non-binding targets. So we've extended the Kyoto Protocol. How are we doing? We've done terribly well, chaps. Russia is out, New Zealand's out, US and Canada out, and even Japan, the la where the Kyoto Protocol was formed, they've pulled out. So they, they may have their own national strategies, but they're out of the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, of course, uh, Doha in uh, Qatar, well, that's the country with the highest per capita emissions on the planet, and they are in do not have binding targets. So effectively, we are going up that top curve of emissions, and what have we done? We've actually weakened the agreement. The countries with binding targets cover about 15% of global emissions, and before you start congratulating yourself that Europe's in there, remember that so much of our products are being produced in China, so actually we've simply exported a large chunk of our greenhouse gases to somewhere else, and uh, we're carrying on feeling slightly self-congratulatory about our greenhouse gas cuts. So the situation over the last year, I'm afraid, with respect to climate change has got worse. So the joy of Europe. So this really did take me a few days on web pages to try and work out what was going on. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. We get all this flack as scientists for not explaining what we are doing um, to policymakers in language that they can explain. 
Try getting the policy stuff as a scientist. So this actually is a kind of, you know, I felt before I started this process that actually I kind of did interact with policy makers quite a bit, and I do. But fundamentally, I realize I don't understand this stuff. On some of the two of the policies I'm going to talk about, I found some big long legal documents. I couldn't understand them. And almost all of the rest of the material I could find was written in such generalities that I had no idea whatsoever whether the change in policy that was being proposed was going to make things better or worse for the environment. So I, I'm, I'm left flabbergasted. Um, Common agricultural policy, which will be, um, uh, which we're heading for 2013 changes, in response to a consultation in May 2012, there was a cap greening document uh, produced. And I've highlighted, you won't be able to see it from the back, probably I've highlighted green in blue, well, that's silly. Um, I couldn't find a definition of greening, though, what is green agriculture? I don't know. The proposed greening measures are compulsory for almost all farmers, apply to the whole farm, and include crop diversification. This sounds like a very kind of low-grade land-sharing strategy where we've got our production all over the place, and we're going to try and do slightly nicer things for wildlife everywhere. There's a very nice poster um, in, on... Um, environmental stewardship consequences for farmland birds showing that those effects are pretty negligible. So there's quite a lot of evidence that land sparing and having really good reserves produces lots and lots of biodiversity, uh, much less that this land sharing approach is going to be uh, very productive. So I would be worried um, as to how this is going to work in practice. And I think that some of the vagueness in the language is probably deliberate, so each country can do what it wants and still be compliant with the law. Common fisheries policy was even more puzzling. Um, so there's going to be multi-annual plans. Uh, that's probably a good idea, both from the economic planning perspective of the fishermen um, and, um, and making sensible, slightly medium to term um, plans, but I'm not sure how they will respond to a very quick fishery collapse. We're going to take an ecosystem approach. I apologize to all of you who've been writing all sorts of things about ecosystem goods and services and uh, all the rest of it, but I couldn't find out what an ecosystem approach meant in the context of this. I think it just means we're going to treat it as water um, and it's got stuff in it. Um, precautionary principle, how precautionary? The scientific data is going to be more reliable. Excellent, should fund us to get more data. Uh, and safeguard resources uh, and generate long-term yields. All of these are wonderful aspirations. I have no, I have got no argument with any of them, but I could not find any document that gave me sufficient detail that I could actually tell whether I thought it was likely to work or not. Now, specifically, there's a fund which might allow um, boats to um, get newer technologies so they could um, uh, concentrate on particular stocks more uh, and get less bycatch, which could be a positive thing. And the discard ban looks like it's going to happen on marketable species, but I could no, find no definition of marketable. Is it at the port you take the ship back to? Is it in the country that you're taking it back to? Or is it a market for that fish species anywhere in the European Union? I'm sure somebody in this room knows, but I couldn't find out in a, a day or so on the web pages. Anyway, there's a vote on this in February 2013 in the European Parliament, and it will be a really important consequence for marine systems around uh, European waters. So, good old Britain. How are we doing? I'm sure we're doing brilliantly by comparison. Um, <clears throat> so, we're cutting red tape, um, and that's making planning easier, and big projects, it's easier to, um, if there's an environmental protest, to ignore it. So I think that means that we have to work more closely with developers to make sure that the projects are, uh, that we're working together towards um, generating good environmental benefits at the same time as these large business projects. And a very nice example is Wallasey Island off the Essex coast, where um, 
four and a half million tons of earth from the crossrail tunnels through London are being deposited. They're coming to this sort of, um, <coughs> they're coming down by, by river. They're then being transferred to these big trucks here that are dumping them in sort, of, in sort of piles all over the place. They're digging other bits out and they're going to turn into a major new wetland reserve um, within this coming decade. And that is almost like, certainly going to be a really important project. Similarly, with the, um, the fast rail to um, the north, you would see there's lots of environmental protests at the moment, but if though that project had really major environmental co-benefit goals, there could be some big gains to be achieved. Another major uh, good thing that's happened this year has been the nature improvement areas, and I'm very sorry, John, was not able to be here because I specifically found the most miserable looking picture I could of him. Um, um, and this, I think, is a rather nice example because there's lots of ecologists in, this, in, the, uh, in the audience here um, and also uh, members of uh, NGOs and amateur naturalists responsible for identifying that we need to take a broader scale approach to conservation, that a single isolated reserve approach doesn't very often work in the long run, at least not for all species. And this has led to a number of landscape scale conservation approaches, and this is a recent report by Butterfly Conservation showing that if you coordinate your management across multiple bits of habitat right throughout the landscape, you can actually generate major recoveries in species, even though their national trend continues to be downwards. So this led into the Lawton et al. report, some of the et al. are here, um, that uh, making space for nature that led into the natural environment white paper that led to, with the change of name into nature improvement areas, big competition, 12 of them declared. And this, I think, has been really successful for multiple reasons. Um, it's too early, really, to say what the biodiversity benefits are, but these projects, I went addressed a meeting in Sussex where there were local town councils, farmers, businesses, uh, um, naturalist representatives, NGO representatives, and uh, environment agency, etc., were present. And I've very rarely been in a room where such diverse interests have all been working together to achieve a common goal of and understand people's re individual requirements of different sectors and work together to a project that might be expected to deliver. And DEFRA already recognized that these projects have leveraged a great deal more money than from other sources than uh, DEFRA already put into it. Similar larger scale conservation projects are um, being discussed in the devolved countries. Northern Ireland is trying to get legislation in so that they can declare national parks. Wales is developing a sustainable development bill and um, Scotland has been consulting on um, 2020 biodiversity challenges um, using, again, the ecosystem type approach emerging from the National Ecosystem Assessment, which many of you were involved in, and the National Ecological Network ideas emerging from the Lawton type review. So this, again, many of the basic principles have emerged from people who are members of this society. One of the specific suggestions is to revise and shorten the Scottish biodiversity list uh, to prioritize funding. And I can see the potential benefits of that. I can also see that there's even more potential issues of taxonomic bias and um, species that basically get ignored. As with almost all of these legislative things that I read, the mechanisms, the specific mechanisms to achieve all of these things, at least to me, as an ecologist trying to work this out, were um, I couldn't find out. And very often when I was looking at documents, there was detail in a legal document that I couldn't understand without legal training because it was by reference to this, that, and the other, which I didn't know what they are. And then accompanying this was effectively the equivalent of a press release um, which said, oh, we're doing lovely things. And whether they are lovely will depend on how they're actually deployed. So just for a little light entertainment to round this off, let's think, you know, a bit like the year's bloopers at the end of a, um, 
talk. What, what are the amusing things to have happened this year? Well, the idea that emerged from last year that we're going to sell all our woods off and be very good capitalists. Um, and, uh, well, uh, Caroline Spellman, then Environment Secretary, uh, declared that we're not going to sell them off in uh, July. Her successor, Owen Patterson, um, um, being faced with ash dieback disease that it, as it invaded the country, uh, had an even better solution that we should wash our children. Um, this was going to solve the, um, solve the spread of the disease across the country. The national security, COBRA, was brought together to discuss this huge menace affecting the world. Um, and this is just madness. The disease emerged 20 years ago, has been spreading across Europe. Admittedly, for the first five years, it wasn't clear it actually was a transmissible disease. It's been in Denmark for nine years, where it's killed 90% of the trees. Suddenly, oh, it's arrived here, what a shock. And during this period, we've been actually sending ash seeds to the near continent, planting them in nurseries, and bringing them back when they've grown up a bit. If it wasn't going to get here anyway, how else could you have guaranteed with greater certainty that it would arrive? But we couldn't do it because it might have been in contravention with trading laws. Well, that is absolute madness, a clear policy failure. So we don't know how it got here, but it's all up the East Coast now. It may have been that it's more to do with natural spread. The blue stars um, spread more widely are where it's present in either very recently planted or nursery stock. So um, uh, it's here to stay, I think. Um, the initial thing was to ban imports. Um, I resisted the temptation to put up a cartoon of stable doors and horses. Um, we shouldn't be moving ash around the place. And now the perfectly sensible decision is that by and large, we're not going to take any action when a tree dies. Lots of potential ecological interest and research that could be accompanying um, a substantial fraction of the country's trees dying if that is what happened. The BBC, of course, reported um, that showed lovely pictures of all these species that were going to be harmed, essentially none of which were associated with ash, one of which was greater spotted woodpecker, which I rather suspect might like there to be a lot more dead trees than there are currently. And then badgers. Ah, oh, I don't know if Charles is still here. He stuck his oar into this one. Um, so um, this was a wonderful plan. We're going to kill badgers in a certain area, reduce the transmission of uh, bovine TB. This is probably one of these issues, though, where the science has can be argued about and. If we were to ask for a vote here of people who know about the science, um, you wouldn't get unanimity anywhere near. And in the context of that, the public are not going to accept this, that we're going to kill the badgers, at least not across the entire country. Lots of protests again. Country file, bless them, have put a picture, a nice cute picture of a badger on the front cover for their calendar for next year, alongside children in need. So you've got to be really horrible to... Um, <laughs> to <laughs> to want to murder all these lovely, pretty, gorgeous, rather ferocious animals. Um, um, so, uh, um, no, uh, we can't sort out the licensing of the, uh, of the shooting, so I, we'll, we'll do it next year, but I rather suspect that this might be conveniently forgotten next year. So just a couple of thoughts to finish up with. Um, apart from the fact that perhaps um, uh, badgers should become a provisioning ecosystem service um, as we consume them. Um, and that is that the large-scale global agreements that require multiple actors with their own parochial worries about the economy and about um, their credit rating of their countries um, and who's getting, who's getting a better deal out of a certain job have basically stopped major developments. The things that have really worked, like the shark sanctuary, the nature improvement areas, have been what I would call more meso-scale things, where you have been able to get multiple interest groups right through industry, government, NGO, members of the public involved to sign up to some common goal. And so let us hope that these multiple small 
actions, um, if they can be spread, uh, might at least have some capacity in the future to dent some of the negative overall global trends that we see. Thank you very much.